The PM says watering down climate targets would be catastrophic for relations with the Pacific and the rest of the world. How would you explain this change to them, in particular, the Pacific nations? Well, I don't think it's any better to lie to them to say that we can achieve something that we actually can't achieve. Under the coalition, we will do as much emissions reduction as we can without harming our economy adversely, and we'll do it better than Labor will because we have a reliable, proven technology in emissions-free nuclear technology, which we promote to roll out in Australia. We're the only party putting forward a coherent plan for reaching net zero by 2050. Labor can't do it on the technology mix that it's proposing. The blue ribbon seats that the Liberals lost to the Teals, how does watering down climate targets convince voters there to come back? How do you get elected again? I live in one of those blue ribbon uh, teal seats uh, and I'm a patron senator for one of those teal seats. And what I've encountered in the electorate is uh, a lot of support and excitement for our emissions-free nuclear energy policy because they understand that this is a technology that's widely used in the international community among all G20 nations, except one, um, among uh, every country that's got an ambitious emissions reduction target, except one, and that it's not responsible to try and reduce our emissions without having a baseload reliable 24-7 uh, electricity source like nuclear. We can achieve our 2050 targets, unlike Labor, because we're proposing to use technology that's widely available internationally that can achieve it. OK. You're speaking today at the uh, Global Information Conference uh, Australia in Adelaide. You want Australia's peak intelligence body to issue annual threat assessments, calling out Chinese foreign interference. Why do you think this is important? Whether Australians know it or not, right now we are on the receiving end of information warfare by foreign authoritarian states, including China. And what those campaigns aim to do is influence our thinking and constrain our choices so that ultimately we make decisions that are consistent with their national interest instead of our own. Now, the good news is that we can push back and we should push back and we can do so in a way that's consistent with our values. All we have to do is tell the truth about what they're up to, particularly in our own region, particularly in the Pacific. We should be calling out their malign activities, their grey zone activities, which involve trying to capture elites in uh, developing countries to corrupt them and to uh, steer them away from the national interest of those countries. And if we do that, that will be a pretty powerful deterrent for countries like China engaging in that behaviour. And it will also equip those countries to better able to, to defend themselves against it. So is the Albanese government, in your opinion, too soft on, on TikTok and, and China over these uh, attacks? Uh, TikTok, just an example, because there's been an, uh, a bit of a to and fro over that. But in the hope of repairing relations in exchange for lifting trade bans, would you agree with that? I don't think we're doing enough to defend our own democracy against external threats, including by addressing vulnerabilities like TikTok. And I don't think we're doing enough to help other democracies in our region defend themselves. And that's why I'm proposing that the Office of National Intelligence publish an annual unclassified assessment of the geopolitical trends and concerning developments in our region involving foreign interference and espionage, cyber attacks and other things, to call that out. And that be accompanied by an annual speech by the Director General of Intelligence to give some flavour to what we're seeing happen in our region with the intelligence that we collect, including with our partners. Would you worry yes, that that would sour relations between that. Australia and China, though? Yes, there may be some bilateral consequences for doing so, but I don't think we should be complicit with our silence. I don't think we should uh, observe abhorrent things happening in our region, which undermines our security and the security of our friends and partners, and stay silent while that happens. Because the reality is the problem is not us calling out that behaviour. It's the behaviour in the first place by the People's Republic of China and others that causes the problems in the bilateral relationship and in our region. And we should be proud and open as a democracy in calling out that malign behaviour. James Patterson, great to have you on the program. Thank you.